to be joyful, don't we? Amen. Even in the midst of difficult times. As the psalmist said, and we just read, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Amen. And we're going to talk about that this morning. <coughs> also want to direct your attention to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, and Philippians, chapter 3. We'll be talking about these passages as well today. Psalm 27 was the first one. <coughs> flyer in there or mark these places. I'm going to go ahead and read Luke 13, beginning of verse 31. It says, At that very hour some Pharisees came and said to him, speaking of Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to, to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then Paul wrote in Philippians 3, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like His glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I long, love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I want to talk to you today about how we respond to opposition. Opposition. Our scriptures, all of these scriptures have this one similar theme, dealing with opposition. Opposition is a sign that you are doing something. You're either doing the Lord's work and you're, being, you're facing opposition from Satan, or hopefully if you're doing Satan's work, you're, you're getting opposition from the Lord and, and from those who love Him. Amen? Amen. 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 You know, who your enemies are who your opponents are, who your opposition is, says more about you than anything else. That's right. Amen. Who is it who is opposing you? If they are the Lord's people, maybe it's time to step back and take a pause and seek his guidance and his wisdom. If it's the enemy, if it's, if it's the devil and those who are following him, you're on the right track. Just keep going and pray for strength. Leadership always brings criticism. I joined a group this week. It's a, it's a group uh, led by a Nazarene pastor who uh, actually used to sing in one of the, the PR groups from Eastern Nazarene College. He sang at one of the camp meetings that I, I attended as a teenager. And uh, he used to pastoring at a church in Virginia name is Bud Reedy, and he formed a church, uh, a group on Facebook uh, that is for missional, building missional churches, basically. One of the things that he shared in that was the concept, I'm not going to state it word for word because I can't recall it word for word, but the concept is that if you are a leader and you are leading, you are going to disappoint someone. It's inevitable. 
and one reason for that is we just tend not to like change. <laughs> Amen? I, we don't even like time changes, do we? No. <laughs> Today's a good day to talk about that. We hate change. And so if you're leading, then you are provoking some kind of movement, some kind of change, some kind of transition. And because of that, you are inevitably going to run into opposition. Isn't that right, Ken? <laughs> you've, you've been in leadership, you've been a principal, you've been on, on the school board, and, and so forth, and uh, anytime you make a decision to do something, there's always going to be someone that's uh, against it. That's right. Somebody was talking to, to me about some other people, and not the ones that uh, you're thinking about, but somebody else. <laughs> that's our DS, I always like to say. Uh, and uh, they said, well, it sounds to me like they're again." Whatever it is. <laughs> there again. <laughs> so, you know, if you're leading, you're going to run into opposition. And opposition, like I said, is a sign that you're doing something. I mean, work involves opposition. Right? When, if, you're, if you're plowing in a row, that ground is going to resist. As you run that tiller or you, you lead your your ox or your, your horse or whatever it is that's pulling the plow, that ground is going to resist. That's why it's called work. Right? If you're not running into resistance, you're not doing anything. If you're not running into opposition, you're not doing anything. Right. So maybe a better question would be, how do we respond when opposition rises up against us? The psalmist responded by declaring, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Amen. When you run into opposition, step one, do not be afraid. Amen. We're going to get to your list in a little bit, so don't get hung up on that. We're going to fill in those blanks. But step one is don't be afraid. Because if you're doing the Lord's work and you're following His guidance and His, His counsel and His word and His law and His precepts, yes, you're going to run into opposition, but don't be afraid. Because the Lord is your light and your salvation. Do not be afraid. Then he expressed confidence in the assurance that his enemy's efforts against him would fail. In verse 2 he said, When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. Mm. Have confidence that your enemies' efforts will be turned around on their own heads. Have any of us been praying this last few weeks that certain people's efforts would turn around and just all on their own hands. Amen. Yep. Let's be confident. God, God is able to do such things. He's done it many, many times in Scripture. More times, really, than we have time to recount this morning. The, the psalmist had confidence because he asked the Lord to be allowed to worship him. And he was confident that the Lord would answer that prayer. Amen. He said, For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And he was assured that he would be able to worship the Lord again, saying, And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. You know, I talked a few weeks ago about the, the, the essential uh, aspect of joy, of, of hope, and how uh, it was, hope was one of the factors that, that those who survived the Holocaust had in common. They had something that they were hoping for. It's been difficult for me. I've been 
watching closely the news reports uh, from the Ukraine, and I've been keeping my eyes focused on the golden domes of that church in Kiev. And I've been thinking, boy, I, I hope that that isn't destroyed. It's a symbol of the faith of the people of Ukraine. Amen. They may not practice their religion the way we do, but they believe in God. They believe in Jesus. They're crying out to God. And really what we're seeing there is a conflict between those who believe in God and those who don't. That's right. Communists are atheistic. They do not believe in God. To them, the, the, the state, the government is God. It provides for all people's needs. And this is a conflict between people of faith and those who do not have faith in God. And I've been watching those golden domes. They, they're a symbol of the faith of the people. They're also a, a source of hope. As long as those golden domes stand, the people have something to remind them that God is out there. He's, he's involved. He cares about them. It's, I, I don't know how you convince somebody that's lost everything that God loves them. But I'm reminded of what the German people said when they returned to their bombed out homeland at the end of World War II when they said we have nothing left but God and so we know that God is enough. Amen. David had the hope that he would once again sing the praises of God in, the, in his tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And that hope kept him going. He remembered that God has told him to seek his face and declares, You have said, Seek my face. My heart says to you, Your face, Lord, I do seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. Seeking the Lord's face. How do we seek the Lord's face in the midst of opposition, in the midst of devastation? And you don't have to be in a war zone to experience devastation as, as uh, we've seen with the floods here recently. How do we look for the Lord's face at times like that? Karen likes to quote Mr. Rogers, who said uh, when something bad happened, he reminded his children, look for the helpers. Yep. Look for the helpers. That's God in action. Amen. Those who are helping are the face of God. Amen. The hands of God. David remembers how God has helped him in the past, even when those closest to him have turned against him. He said, O oh, you who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not, O oh, God of my salvation, for my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Amen. 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 I don't know what the circumstances are, if David's father and mother had literally forsaken him or not. It would be interesting to know the background on that. But I think what he's saying is that those closest to me, the ones I trusted the most, even they have turned their backs on me. But God will not turn his back on us. Amen. Even if we've been disobedient, as Ken was sharing in Sunday school this morning, God's love extends even to those who sin and are arrogant and prideful and turn against him. He, does, he, is, he is for us in the sense that he wants to save our souls. He wants us to turn around and live righteous lives. He's for us, even when we're against Him. Mark Twain said that uh, home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to let you in. <laughs> but David's saying, Man, my own family won't take me in. But God will. When it seems like everybody else has rejected you and abandoned you, God will take you in. You can turn to him. He asked the Lord to teach him. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. You know, our enemies often do a lot more homework and preparation in opposing us than, than we do hmm. in being prepared for that opposition. Hmm. Help us. We need to be teachable. We need to never get to the place in our lives where we think 
I think I know everything I need to know to make it the rest of the way. Mm. You know, that's usually when the floor falls out from underneath me. Just about the time, and my dad told me this when I was learning how to drive. He said, always be cautious when you think you've got it all under control. Because that's when something will happen that you didn't anticipate. We need to be teachable. We need to be learners. Even no matter how old you are, no matter how long you've been studying the Bible, no matter how many little uh, Sunday school banners you got hanging from that lapel pin. You remember when we used to do the lapel pins? Yeah. And, and you get a, you start off with a little white center when you had one year of perfect attendance in Sunday school. And then you get a little wreath that goes around it. You remember? And then from that wreath you can hang. That was the wreath was year two, and then from that you hung year three, four through fifty. I guess I don't know how many. Of them <laughs> I guess if you if you got to where it was pulling you over like this, you know, you were probably old enough to be doing that anyway. But <laughs> doesn't matter how many perfect attendance banners you got hanging from your little Sunday school lapel pin. We still need to be teachable. Amen. We still need to be learning and to seek to be taught by the Lord and lead us on a level path, have an even keel. You know, don't get, don't get waylaid, you know, by, by little things. And one, another thought is that in the midst of difficult times and stressful times like we've been going through lately, and we see this happening everywhere, Sometimes it takes just the tiniest little thing to knock us off our even keel. Have you noticed? Yes. Same people are doing the dumbest things and becoming violent and abusive and screaming at each other over the tiniest little things. Because there's so much stress that we just can't handle this one little thing. We're not going to put up with it, you know? And that's just an indication of where we are as a civilization, uh -huh. yeah. as a culture. But he says, lead me in a level path. Have, have it, help us to have an even keel and not to be knocked on our heels or knocked on our side by tiny little things or even major things. David turned to God for protection from his enemies. He said, give me not up to the will of my adversaries for false witnesses have risen against me and they breathe out violence. And, you know, whenever I've been reading these psalms lately, this morning in Sunday school, and, and even as I've read through this, I thought, boy, this, is, this sounds so much like what's happening in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me. There's all kinds of, of uh, mis, misinformation going out about the people in Ukraine and uh, people in Russia trying to uh, justify their actions. False witnesses are risen against me and they breathe out violence. Boy, it's just a, it's a word picture for what we're seeing over there. Hmm. Happens here too. It's happening right here in our own culture. It doesn't have to be bullets and bombs. It can be accusations, threats, false information. David expresses confidence in the future. He said, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord and in the land of the living. He's, he's, you know, people say, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to see the Lord. Yeah, you're going to see the Lord because I'm going to send you to see him right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, he says, uh, in the land of the living, I Amen. will see the goodness of the Lord. Amen. Boy, that's hope. Then he seems to say to himself, Wait. It's important to be reminded <laughs> to wait. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves to wait. Wait for the Lord, he says. Be strong and let your heart take courage. And he repeats, wait for the Lord. All right, so here are the ten ways that psalmist responded to opposition. He said, God is my salvation and refuge. And this should pop up there Then he said, my enemies will fail. 
He said, because I seek to worship the Lord, He will protect me and lift me up. I will sing the Lord's praises again, He said. I will seek the Lord's face just as He instructed. God has helped me in the past and will do so again. I want to learn from the Lord. I turn to God for protection from my enemies. This is not the end for me. <laughs> I will wait for the Lord. And that last one really is a challenge for all of us. <clears throat> when we're in a moment of stress or crisis, the natural inclination is to act more correctly, to react to whatever threat we perceive. But this is, in reality, a manifestation of of our fallen natural desire to be in control of the things happening around us. We want to be Lord. We want to have control. We want to fix things when they're messed up. With, with, with guys, generally, it's, you know, we try to fix whatever's broken. With ladies, I think we try to fix whoever is broken. Notice the difference? <laughs> Waiting goes against human nature. That is human nature in our natural born state. Just You want proof? Just look at a baby. Beautiful, pure, innocent, unspoiled. And yet, when it wants to be fed or burped or changed, it makes such a ruckus that a, and a racket that no one within earshot will be happy until it gets its way. <laughs> Amen? Amen. In another place, the psalmist declared, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin. My mother conceived me. Sadly, some of us never move fully beyond that phase of life. Mm -hmm. We want what we want, and we want it now, and we will make anyone and everyone around us miserable until we get it. Mm. <laughs> Somebody stole my son. Oh, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> there is a cure for this natural born state it's the heart cleansing blood of Jesus and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit of God Ezekiel said in 36 25 through 27 God speaking I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols I will cleanse you in other words, you'll love me more than anything else. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Waiting is actually an act of worship. Have you ever considered that? Waiting is an act of worship. Waiting is worship. It, it is saying to God, I desire your will and your way and your timing even more than my own. Waiting is a spiritual discipline. It's a way of subordinating ourselves to the timing of God. How appropriate is this during the Lenten season? subordinating ourselves to God's timing, to His will, to His plan, fasting and praying and obeying, resisting temptation. Waiting is the ultimate form of trust. It's a way of saying, I don't have to understand or even know the whys and the wherefores behind God's actions or inactions from my perspective. Rather, I choose to believe that God is working in ways that I cannot see or understand. Hmm. When we come to the gospel portion today, were any of you surprised, as I was, that, that it said that at that very same hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here for Herod's trying to kill you? The Pharisees warned I mean, Peter had already told him, Lord, if they're going to kill you in Jerusalem, don't go. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking as God thinks, but as man thinks. 
But then the Pharisees come to him and say, hey, get out of here, Herod's trying to kill you. And Jesus, I, I love his response. To it. How is it that the Pharisees are the ones warning Jesus not to go to Jerusalem? Weren't they the ones who eventually orchestrated his death? Yes, but there were some Pharisees who were either open-minded about Jesus or who actually were admirers of him, and some actually tried to stand up for him in that fake trial. Most likely it's these who came to him to warn him about the danger he was in, but Jesus' response is great. He said, you go tell that fox. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. He knew where he was going. He knew what he was facing. He knew what was going to happen when he got there, and he didn't care. He was not just being flippant or flamboyant here. He was being sincere. He knew of Herod's plot, and he knew of the Pharisees' plot, he knew that he would die in Jerusalem, but he was not going to be deterred from carrying out his ministry prematurely. He would face death on his own terms. He even said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down freely. He said, I have the power, the authority to lay it down and to take it up again. This is yet another way to deal with confrontation, and that is to focus on the task at hand and persist in the work. You remember when Nehemiah set out to rebuild the wall, Sambalad, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, tried to coax him away from the work. Come and meet with us out here on the plains of Ono. And of course, every good pastor always says, and Nehemiah said, oh, no. He says, I'm doing a good work here, a great work. I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And he says, they sent to me four times this way, and I answered them in the same manner. And then they began with the threats. When you know you're doing the Lord's work and someone tries to distract or discourage you, focus on the task at hand. Don't be distracted by false accusations or attempts to take you away from the work. Just keep working. And trust that God will work out his plan through you in the end. When Paul wrote to the Philippian Christians, he encouraged them to stand firm in the face of opposition for two reasons. He said, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, their glory is in their shame, their minds are set on earthly things. But the second reason, he said, is our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. In other words, it doesn't really matter what happens to these bodies, what our enemies do to these bodies. Our, hope is, our focus is not in this world as far as our salvation is concerned. God is our salvation. We're going to do the work that he's given us to do. We're not going to allow our enemies and their threats to distract us because our citizenship is in heaven. Our True allegiance is not to the things of this world or even the governments and agencies of this world. Our true allegiance is to God, to the Lord. Once again, we're reminded to believe that God in His timing will make sure that those who oppose Him and His people will pay for their deeds. And once again, we're reminded that God has promised to reward those who trust and obey and honor Him especially those who do so in the face of opposition. And I believe that the greater the opposition is in this life, the greater the reward will be in the next. So I've given you the first ten, I believe, items. And then we get to Jesus, and when he responded to threats about Herod's desire to kill him, he responded by focusing and persisting in the work the Father had given him to do. There you go. And Paul reminds us that those who oppose us, their end is destruction, and their God is their bellies, etc. But our citizenship is in heaven. Amen. And we await a Savior from there. If we are doing the Lord's work, we're going to run into opposition. 
if we're not running into opposition, we need to pray and ask God to help us to be more diligent in doing his work. Amen? Amen. Amen. Who wants opposition? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's hard to get excited about that, isn't it? But shouldn't we? I, I remember the time when the disciples, the apostles, after Jesus went back to the Father, when they were being punished. I think they were beaten for preaching the gospel. And we're told that they rejoiced that they were counted worthy of suffering for the name of Jesus. They, they were running into opposition, so they knew they were doing the Lord's work. Amen. If you're not running into opposition, it's time to pray. Amen. That the Lord will help us to do something. They will get the enemy's attention and uh, cause him to be a little nervous. Amen? Amen. That's... Who's going to pray for that? Lord, send us opposition. <laughs> but you know, it's also in, in opposition that we be grow stronger. Uh, there's this resistance training that athletes do when you rubber bands or whatever to, to strengthen their muscles. There's resistance. If there's no resistance, you're not going to get stronger. And we need to be getting stronger, right? No matter what our bodies do, spiritually speaking, we need to be getting stronger every day, amen? amen? And we can't do that without opposition, without resistance. So let's let's face it, let's let's accept that it's going to happen if we're doing the Lord's work. Let's make sure that the ones opposing us are the ones who are opposed to Him, and we'll know we're doing the right thing. And the Lord will help us. And remember all these things I just threw at you. Keep your little sheets handy. Stick them in your Bible. It might be good to hang on to when you find yourself going through a difficult time. To be reminded how to respond when we face opposition. Would you stand with me and we'll close with the response and benediction. Heavenly Father, you have met with us here today. And given to us your word. Help us now to receive your truth and to allow it to work your will in our heads, in our hearts, and through our hands. In Jesus' name, amen. And bless the Lord and one another with these words. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. God bless you. Go in peace. Tell five people you're glad they came to thank you today. Thank you for the message, Pastor. Thank you.